have some time to be alive. Because God is doing some great things. God's doing some phenomenal things. And I believe in my spirit. I believe in my heart that you are next in line for a miracle. How many believe that? How many believe that you're next in line for a miracle? How many know that God is doing some astronomical things? And you are indeed next in line for a miracle. For those of you that are coming in, go ahead and uh, invite your followers. I want to talk about something that, uh, that I heard in my spirit. Um, but I want to talk about, I want to talk about gifts in ministry versus fathers in ministry. Gifts in ministry versus fathers in ministry. Uh, because we are, we are living in a day and we are living in a time where, for the most part, uh, the pews are becoming more educated than the pulpit. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. We are living in a day and in a time whereby the pews are becoming more educated than the pulpit. Um, of course, we understand that uh, that the pulpit should be more educated than the pews. Uh, the pastors should be more educated than the sheep. Uh, the leader should be more educated than the follower. Uh, but unfortunately so, we are living in a day and we are living in a time whereby the sheep are becoming more educated than the shepherds. The pews are becoming more educated than the pulpit. The followers are becoming more educated than the leaders. And, uh, and because we're living in a historical era uh, of the kingdom where the sheep are becoming more educated than the shepherd, it's difficult for sheep to find shepherds to connect themselves with that are, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, that are worthy enough to lead them, uh, for, for a lack of better words, um, that, that, are, that are qualified enough uh, I should say, for a lack of better words, to to lead them. Um, I believe that one of the reasons why the church um, is struggling so is because we have a lot of gifted pastors, but we do not have enough matured pastors. One of the reasons why, one of the reasons why, I didn't necessarily say the reason why, but one of the reasons why the church is struggling so is because we, we have a lot of gifted pastors, but we do not have a lot of matured pastors. And I've discovered that we are living in a day and we are living in a time where the church is concerned, whereby people are not looking for just gifted pastors. People are looking for matured pastors. Um, 
I, I remember there was a day and, and there was a time of old where all the church pretty much cared about was a pastor who had a gift. All, all the church really cared about was a pastor who was able to preach, a pastor who was able to teach, a pastor who was able to hoop, a pastor who was able to holler, a pastor who was able to sing, a pastor who had the ability to curve all of his L's and loop all of his R's and dot all of his I's and cross all of his T's. There was a day and time back in the day uh, whereby all we were, and I say we, and I speak in, rela in relation to the church at large, uh, there was a time and there was a day whereby the only thing we were concerned about was a gifted pastor. All we wanted was a pastor who was able to hoop and who was able to holler and who was able to scream and sweat and grab his ear and run around the pulpit. That's pretty much what we were looking for. Um, we weren't looking for ministries. We were looking for celebrities. We weren't looking for ministers, rather. We were looking for celebrities. Um, but we're living in a day and time now where, again, the pews are becoming more educated. And because the sheep are now becoming more educated, uh, we are living in a day and time where we are looking for, and when I say we, I'm speaking in reference, of course, to the body of Christ at large. We, we are looking for more than just a gift to hoop. We're looking for more than just a gift to holler. We're looking for more than, than someone, you know, to sing us, someone that's going to sing us into a frenzy. But, but we're looking for someone who's going to enlighten us now. We're looking for pastors that are going to enlighten us. We're looking for pastors that are going to educate us. Uh, we're looking for, for pastors that are going to help to mature us and, and to develop us and, and, and to discipline us because we're in a place now where we want better. You know, uh, it's it's not just about uh, getting me emotionally stirred. I mean, there was a time where people just wanted to be emotionally stirred. You know, we, we kind of used church like a drug. Give me my quick fix on Sunday so I can be well for Monday. And I'll be all right Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday until I go back you know, to the drug house on Sunday and get my quick fix again. Uh, people are becoming more educated and, and, and it's not about being emotionally stirred anymore. I need to be enlightened. I, I need to be biblically uh, educated. I need to have an insight and an understanding in relation to what the Word of God is saying. Uh, Paul says something in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, um, right about verse 15. Can someone write that for me? I just want to minister for a little while and I'm out of here. I promise not to keep you long. I'm not, I'm not here unless the Lord lead me that way. I'm not really here to individually prophesy to anyone. I uh, just want to kind of drop something in your spirit to enlighten you uh, to where the kingdom of God is in this earth and in, in, in this season and in this time and at this hour. Uh, Paul says something very, very thought-provoking in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, right about verse 15. He says something very thought-provoking. He says something that's very interesting. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, right about verse 15. He says, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, he says, Yet have ye not many fathers, Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. That ministered to me. That ministered to me in a way in which you know not. First Corinthians chapter 4, right about verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, 
He says, yet have ye not many fathers. And, and what Paul is actually saying is that we have a lot of gifted people. But one of the reasons why the church is struggling is because we just don't have a lot of matured people. Uh, Paul says, Paul says, we, Paul says we have a lot of gifted pastors. Uh, but one of the reasons why the church is so struggling is because we just don't have enough of matured pastors. Uh, when he talks about instructors uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, right about verse 15, he's actually talking about preachers. He's talking about teachers. Uh, preaching, um, whether you knew it or not, is a gift that's come from God. Preaching is a gift. A teaching, whether you know it or not, is a gift that has come from God. Paul says we have a lot of instructors. We have a lot of preaching. We have a lot of teaching. We have a lot of people in the body of Christ who have a gift to preach and a gift to teach. He says, but one thing that we're lacking, watch this now, is that we are lacking fathers. We, we are lacking matured preachers. And we are, we are lacking matured teachers. We are lacking men and women of God who have the ability uh, and, and the dexterity and the capacity and the integrity to, to mature us and to, and to instruct us and, and to discipline us and, and, to, and to develop us. Uh, time is out for people who have gifts without maturity. I, you know, I, I don't care. I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care how gifted you are. If you are not matured in your gift, then, then you do nothing. You do nothing but damage the people of God and the body of Christ with just a gift. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, right about verse 15, he says, we have a lot of gifted people. We just don't, we just don't have a lot of matured people. And uh, I've discovered that, that we're living in a day and we're living in a time whereby sheep are not just looking for pastors who have gifts. We're looking for pastors who are, are fathers. We're, we're, looking, we're looking for pastors, you know, who have more than just the ability to preach. We're looking for pastors who have more than just the dexterity to teach. We're looking for pastors who can do more than, than hoop us into a frenzy and, and sing us into a shout. And uh, uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, there are those who, who are looking for pastors, placing pastors who have the ability to preach and to teach and to sing you into a frenzy, but yet no maturity, have no, have no fathering skills uh, whatsoever. But the time is out. Time is out where people are just looking for pastors who can just preach them into a, fi a frenzy and, and, and sing them into a shout in the dance. We're, they're, they're, we're looking for people. People are looking for pastors now. People are looking for pastors who, who are fathers in the spirit. You've got more than just a gift. See, see you can be gifted but still not be matured. I mean, I've, I listen, I've walked this walk for a long time and I've seen a whole lot of gifted, immature folk. I'm, I'm talking about gifted, immature pastors, gifted, immature worship leaders, because here, here's the deal and, and here's what we have to have an understanding of is that your gift does not determine your level of maturity. Just because you're a gifted man and woman of God doesn't mean you're a spiritually matured man or woman of God because I, I know a whole lot of gifted people that are spiritually immatured. I mean, you know, when the gifts and, and calling of God 
uh, the word of God says, or, or without repentance. I mean, God gives you a gift. You, you know, you, you've got developing, you've got to, you've got to develop in, in, in maturity, but he gives you a gift. And, and we should never measure a man or a, or a woman's gift and equate their gift to their maturity because just because you are a gifted man doesn't mean you're a matured man. I mean, you, you, can, you can have the gift of enough to, to preach until you knock somebody out. Doesn't mean that you're mature. You, you can have the gift enough to sing until you got the whole church shouting. Doesn't mean you're spiritually matured. And we're living in a day and we're living in a time whereby people are looking for more than just a gift. They're looking for men and women of God who are walking in integrity. They're looking for men and women of God who can be fathers, who can be mothers, who can lead us into places of development and 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 and, 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 and maturity. There was a scripture out of the book of uh, John chapter 20, right about verse 22. So I want to put that on the screen for me. I'm going to be here for about maybe another five minutes and I'm out of here. Just something I want to drop in your spirit. John chapter 20, right about verse 22. Something amazing uh, is actually transpiring uh, and transitioning in the text. In John chapter 20, right about verse 22. Uh, but in John chapter 20, right about verse 22, Jesus meets his disciples behind closed doors. And the scripture says, after Jesus had been resurrected, watch this now, it says, and he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And something amazingly astronomical is happening uh, behind closed doors in the gospel according to John, right about verse 20 and 22. And um, it is not so much what Jesus does that's important, but it is the timing in which he does it. Uh, I've discovered that in some scriptures it is what's important, but that in others it's the timing in which he does it. Uh, in, in the book of Genesis, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living soul, it was what God did that was so powerfully profound. He breathed into Adam's nostrils. It was what he did. But in the gospel, according to John chapter 20, right about verse 22, it is not what Jesus does that is so powerfully profound. But watch this now. It is, it is when he decided to do it. For the very first time in biblical historicity, we find that Jesus is found breathing on his disciples. And none other, and no other synoptic gospel, the word synoptic simply means similar in content. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are referred to. Uh, historically as synoptic gospels, which means that they are similar uh, in content. Uh, and no other scripture in the New Testament gospel uh, do we find Jesus breathing on his disciples until after, watch this now, he had died to the flesh. He had died to the flesh. John 20 and 22 it says, and he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Jesus says this to his disciples. Watch this now. He says, I do not want you to receive what I'm trying to be. I do not want you to receive what I desire to be. I do not want you to receive, watch this now, what I aspire to be. I do not want you to receive what I'm praying to be, but I want you to receive, here it is, who I am. Who was he in the gospel according to John chapter 20, verse 22? He was the Holy Ghost. He was the Spirit of God. 
and he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. In the gospel according to Matthew, the word of God says this, Jesus says, these words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Whenever someone breathes on you, they are ministering to you. And he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. It is imperatively significant that you do not give your ear to everything and to everyone. Because whoever you give your ear to, watch this now, imparts themselves into you. I don't listen to everything. I don't listen to everybody because I have an understanding that my ear gates are doorways to my spirit and to my soul. Be careful who you allow to breathe on you. Be careful who you allow to minister to you. Be careful to who you allow to speak into your life. I don't let everybody speak into my life. I don't, I don't let everybody breathe on me. I don't, I don't let everybody minister unto me. Because whoever breathes upon you, watch this now, you take in whatever it is that they're breathing, whatever it is that they're saying. How does a person breathe on you? They breathe on you when they speak to you. And he breathed on them, watch this now, and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. How does he breathe? He breathes when he says, right now, for everybody under the sound of my voice, I'm breathing on you. I'm saying to you. I'm imparting the spirit of my words into you. It says that he breathes upon them and says to them, watch this now, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive not what I desire to be. Receive not what I aspire to be. Receive not what I hope to be, but receive who I am. When he breathes upon them and says, he breathes upon them, watch this now, after he himself had died to the flesh. One of the reasons why the church is struggling so is because we've got men and women of God who are breathing on us trying to get us to die to what they themselves are still alive to. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. One of the reasons why the church is so struggling is because we've got men and women of God all across the globe that are breathing on us trying to get us to die to what they themselves are still alive to. When Jesus breathes upon his disciples in the gospel, according to John chapter 20, right about verse 22, he breathes upon them after he dies to his flesh. He doesn't breathe upon them when he's yet still alive to his flesh, but he breathes upon them after he himself dies to the flesh. And I want to say this to every minister and conduit of the gospel. Stop trying to get people to publicly die to what you yourself are secretly still struggling with. Stop trying to get people to publicly die to what you are still secretly alive to. See, you, you can't preach against homosexuality publicly if you're still struggling with homosexuality privately. You, you can't preach against lesbianism publicly if you yourself 
are still struggling with lesbianism privately. You, you, you can't preach against lying publicly if you yourself are still struggling with lying privately. You can't, you can't preach against fornication publicly if you yourself are still struggling with fornication privately. Y'all ain't. You, 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 can't, you can't preach. You can't preach against pornography publicly if you yourself are struggling with pornography privately. You can't preach against adultery publicly if you yourself are still struggling with adultery privately. What, whatever it is you are struggling with privately, you can't preach against it publicly. Listen to what it says. Now, John chapter 20, right about verse 22, it says, And Jesus breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Re receive not what I want to be, not what I desire to be, but receive who I am. You can only get people to become what you are. I, I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again because that ministered to me. You can only get people to become who you are. That there are some things, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you about me. I'm going to be scientific with you. I'm going to be open. About, there are some things that I am not qualified to preach publicly because I'm still struggling with privately. And I can't get you freed if I'm still bound. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I said there are some things that I that I that I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not empowered to preach publicly because I'm still struggling with privately and I can't get you freed if I'm still bound. Jesus said to his disciples, "I can breathe on you and I can tell you to receive the Holy Ghost why? Because that's who I am." My God, I feel glory because that's, that's who I am. I'm, I'm not telling you, watch this down. I'm not telling you to receive something that, that, that I'm trying to be. I'm not telling you to, to, to receive something that I desire to be. I'm not telling you to receive something that I'm praying about being. I'm telling you to receive who I am. I'm empowered to breathe on you and tell you to receive the Holy Ghost because I am the Holy Ghost. Uh, watch this now. I have already become what I'm trying to impart into your spirit. And one of the reasons why the church is struggling in so many areas is because we've got men and women of God in pulpits all across America that are trying to free people from things publicly that they themselves are still struggling with privately, not knowing that before they can free others, they've got to free themselves first. And I love what Jesus says. If you look at the text, John chapter 20, right about verse 22. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. In, in John chapter 20, verse 22, it says, watch this now. And he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Watch this now. Jesus says, I'm not interested in your responding. I'm interested in your receiving. 
See, the, the difference between gifted people and matured people is that gifted people only want you to respond. Matured people are looking for you to receive. The God, John chapter 20, it's, it's in the text. I'm, I'm not lying. It's in the text. John chapter 20, right about verse 22. And he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive not what I desire to be, not what I want to be, not what I aspire to be, not what I'm trying to be, not what I'm praying about be, but receive who I am. He, he doesn't say to, he, listen, watch this down. He's, he, he's not concerned about them responding. He's concerned about them receiving. In churches all over America, for the most part, it is filled with people that are only concerned about you responding. They want you to clap loud enough. They want you to shout loud enough. They want you to run around the church. They want you to turn backflips. They want you to turn tumble saws. They want you to high five your neighbor. Jesus says, listen, I'm not concerned about your responding. I'm concerned about your receiving. I wonder, I wonder how it really was in the days when Christ ministered to his disciples, when, when he ministered to multitudes, I guarantee you, you, can, you could literally almost hear a pin drop. People weren't screaming and shouting and high-fiving their neighbor, pulling their weaves out, leap press on nails all over the floor. No, folk were sitting there receiving. The difference between the church then and the church now is that we respond off of everything and receive nothing because all we want is a quick emotional fix. Everybody won't get their shout on. Everybody won't get their dance on. Have you ever heard folk who, who went to church tell me, girl, that man know he preached today. Well, girl, what did he preach about? I don't know what he preached about, but it was good. Really? Really? You don't know what the man preached about, but it was good. <laughs> and he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Jesus says, I'm not concerned about your responding. I'm concerned about your receiving. Responding Responding equals stagnation. Receiving equals maturation, maturity. I'm, my, my desire, Jesus says, my desire is for you to mature. We're living in a day and time. Now where all people want to all people want to do is respond off of the word. We won't clap off the word. We shout, high five our neighbor, run around the church, scream, holler, spitting on everybody. And nobody's getting nothing out of the message. Because we've got a bunch of preachers that are more interested in you responding than they are receiving. Paul says if we had if we had more fathers. First Corinthians four and fifteen, he says, For though ye have ten thousand instructors, ten thousand teachers, ten thousand preachers in Christ, he says, Ye have not many fathers. There's very few people that are really, Paul says, interested in your maturity. Jesus was a father because his desire was not for his disciples to respond. His desire was for his disciples to receive. And he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 
And, and once again, once again, when he breathes upon his disciples, he breathes upon them when he has died to the flesh. Stop trying to get people to die to what you yourself are still alive to. I'm talking to pastors, I'm talking to bishops, I'm talking to prophets, I'm talking to evangelists, I'm talking to carriers and conduits of the gospel. You cannot get people to change when you yourself are still bound. Jesus, Jesus says, I can tell you to receive the Holy Ghost. Watch this now, because I am the Holy Ghost. I have already become what I'm trying to get you to be. Are you with me? He says, I've already become what I'm trying to get you to be. And he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive not what I desire to be, not what I want to be, not what I aspire to be, but receive who I am. One of the reasons why the church is struggling so is because we got men and women of God all across America, globally, ecumenically, internationally, where men and women of God all across America that are trying to get people to publicly die to what they themselves are privately still alive to. I, I can't get you to die to something that I myself am still struggling with. Again, it is interesting in the gospel according to John chapter 20, right about verse 22. It is interesting that the first time that Jesus is found breathing on his disciples, read the text, read the text is there. I'm not making this up. It's in the text. It is interesting to note that the very first time that Jesus is ever in biblical historicity, the very first time that Jesus is ever found breathing on his disciples is when he himself had died to his flesh. No other time do you ever find the word of God saying, and he breathed on them and saith unto them. No other time in the Holy Writ. Do you ever find that until after Jesus himself dies to his flesh? When he dies to his flesh and he meets his disciples behind closed doors and he's now in the spirit, then he breathes upon them and says unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive not what I desire to be, but receive who I am. I can't get you, I can't get you delivered from homosexuality if I'm privately struggling with homosexuality. But whatever I am privately struggling with, I've got to get delivered first before I can breathe or preach or minister deliverance into you. Are you with me? If it's, if it's pornography that you're struggling with, you can't minister to somebody else about pornography publicly if you are still struggling with pornography privately. No, Jesus said you got to get delivered first. You got to die to your flesh first. And once you die to your flesh in private, then you can minister and get people delivered in public. But don't try to get folk delivered in public when you yourself are still struggling in private. Preachers all around America, pastors all around America want to know why your folk ain't changing. Your folk are not changing because you ain't changing. Shepherds want to know why their sheep ain't changing. Your sheep ain't changing because you ain't changing. Your sheep haven't been delivered because you haven't been delivered. Your sheep ain't being set free because you're not being set free. You, you can't get your sheep to be delivered from something publicly that you yourself are struggling with privately. A 
whole lot of stuff that men and women of God are preaching all across America sounds good. Folk are going to church just for that, just to have church. Ain't nobody being delivered. Very few are being set free because we've got men and women of God who are ministering to us trying to get us delivered from something publicly that they themselves are still struggling with privately. If change and transformation is going to come to the body of Christ, we need men of God in pulpits who are not just gifted men but we need fathers we we are y'all with me we we need fathers we we need women of god in the pulpit who are not just gifted women of god but we need we need mothers Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 and 15, he's once again, he says, for though ye have 10,000 instructors, for though ye have 10,000 uh, 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 preachers, Paul said, for though ye have 10,000 teachers in Christ, he says, yet have ye not many fathers. Paul says, listen, the church have a lot of gifted men. We just don't have enough matured men. We we need matured men and women of God that are going to minister to us, that are going to help develop us, help disciple us, help discipline us, help, help to instruct us. There's an old saying that says the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Thank God for gifts. Thank, thank God. Listen, I, I, I appreciate a good gift. Thank God for gifts. But we need more than gifted men in the pulpit. We need more than gifted men. Thank God for your ability to preach folk into a frenzy. But we need more than gifted men. We need matured men. Paul says we got VUKU instructors. We just don't have enough fathers. And he's talking about gifts versus uh, the gifting of a man versus the father of a man. We need men that are going to be fathers. Men that are going to be men of integrity. Men of, intu men, men of maturity. Men of maturity. Men that are going to help to develop us. And not just emotionally stir us. Time out for being emotionally stirred. We we need to be educated. We we need to be we need to be enlightened. God says in Hosea chapter four, verse six, he says, Listen, my people are being destroyed. Watch this now. And they're being destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. We have no insight of the word of God, no understanding of the word of God, no revelation of the word of God, no, no illumination of the word of God. Gospel according to John, Jesus comes to his disciples. He says, listen, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they just begin to rabble off. Oh, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say that thou uh, art Elias. And others say that you're just one of the prophets. He flips the script and changes the channel. He says, who do you say? that I, the Son of Man, am. And the Word of God tells us that the eleven in whom were so apt and so quick to say what others were saying were brought to a complete hush. They had walked with him and had talked with him but didn't even know him. Isn't it amazing that you've got folk in the house of God that are walking with him and talking with him but yet don't know him? Do you not know that people can walk with you and talk with you but still not really know you? They walked with him. And they talked with him, but yet they still did not know him. Watch this now. They knew what others were saying about him, but they didn't really know him. 
And out of the 12 in whom Jesus had chosen, there was a disciple by the name of Peter who raised his hand and he says, Lord, I know who you are. And Jesus says, who am I? He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which simply means the anointed one and his anointing. You are not just the giver of the anointing. He says, you are the anointing. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christos. Thou art the anointed one and his anointing. Jesus said to Peter, he says, flesh and blood do not reveal this unto you. But my father in heaven, Peter had a revelation. Peter had a revelation. The other 11 had an opinion nation. Peter had a revelation. The, the, the 11 represented the masses. Peter represented the remnant. Are you with me? The 11 represented the masses. Peter represented the remnant. And amazingly so, there's only a remnant of the body of Christ who really know who he is. The masses are still guessing at who he is. The masses have an opinionation. The only thing they know about God is what other people are saying. Shame on you if the only thing you know about God is what your pastor is preaching on Sunday. Shame on you if the only thing you know about God is what your man of God is teaching on the Bible study on a Tuesday and on a Wednesday. Shame on you and all your houses. The 11 knew nothing about him. Some say, oh, the only thing they knew about Jesus was what some were saying and others were saying. But they had no insight and no revelation of their own. Jesus said to Peter, he says, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my father in heaven. And when you read down, watch this now, here's a revelation. He says, and I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom. Notice that he has 12 disciples. He doesn't say, I will give unto y'all the keys to the kingdom. He says, I will give unto thee. He doesn't say, I will give unto them. He says, I will give unto thee. Watch this now. Thee is not plural. Thee is singular. In whom was Jesus speaking in reference to? He was speaking to Peter. He says, I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom. Watch this now. And whatsoever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is already loose in heaven. One of the reasons why the church is so powerless is because we have no real revelation of who he is. I will give unto thee the keys. You know what a revelation is? It's a key. You know what a key does? A key can either open a door or it can unlock a door. A revelation of the word of God is a key. He says, I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom. I'm Peter, look, Peter had a revelation. He had a revelation. Peter doesn't have an opinionation of who God is. He has a revelation of who God is. Many of us only have an opinionation. Very few of us have a revelation. Peter had a revelation in relation to who Jesus was. He said, thou art, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom. You know what keys represents? Keys represents power and keys represents authority. One of the reasons why the church has no power, one of the reasons why the church has no authority is because we have no revelation. All we have is an opinionation. And you got folk around here trying to bind stuff and loose stuff. God says, listen, you can't bind nothing and you can't loose nothing because all you have is an opinionation. You can't bind and loose with an opinionation. You can only bind and loose with a revelation. I've got binding power and loosing power. Why? Because I've got a revelation of the word of God. I've got insight. I've got understanding. You got folk around here right now in the church. I bind you in the name of Jesus. God says you can't buy nothing with an opinion nation. You got to have a revelation. I loose it in the name of Jesus. God says you can't loose nothing with an opinion nation. You can only loose it with a revelation. 
The 11 had an opinionation. They didn't really know who he was. They knew of him. They didn't know him. Do you know how many people are walking with Christ and talking with Christ but yet don't know Christ? One of the reasons why folk are so powerless in the church trying to bind demons and can't even take authority over a headache. Go sit down somewhere, y'all. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Trying to bind demons and can't even take authority over a headache. Sit down. The church is walking around. No authority. No power. Because we have no revelation of the word of God. You need a revelation. You need a revelation. You Listen, you've got to know more about God than what Prophet Mitchell has to say about God. You, you've got to know more about God than what your pastors say about God. You've got to have a revelation for yourself. Are you with me? Bottom line is, bottom line is, bottom line is, and I'm out of here, is that we need more. We need more than just gifted men. We need matured men. We need, we need more than just gifted women. We need matured women. And listen, I'm, I'm not intrigued by a man's gift. That, that doesn't move me. That doesn't move me. And you know why I'm not intrigued by just a man's gift? Because I'm matured enough to have an understanding that you can be a matured, you can be a gifted man, but still not be a matured man. I'm not, I'm not intrigued by a man's gift. I'm not, I'm not moved by a woman's ability. I'm intrigued by your spiritual maturity. I'm moved by your spiritual maturity. Get, get beyond the point. Listen to me. Are y'all with me? Get beyond the the point, get beyond the point of being intrigued by a man's gift. Because you got a whole lot of gifted, immature people out there. Get beyond the point where you're intrigued by a woman's gift. You want to impress me? Walk in spiritual maturity. Praise the Lord, everybody. I said, you want to you wanna impress me? Walk in spiritual maturity before me. That impresses me. It's not your ability to preach. Are you with me? It's not your ability to preach. It's not your ability to teach. It's not your ability to scream and to hoop and to holler and to sing. I don't care about how loud you get. I don't care. I don't care about how articulate you are. I mean, you you can sing. You can sing until heaven comes down. I'm, I'm not I'm not concerned about that. Concerned about your spiritual maturity. Are you with me? I'm out of here. Love you with my spirit. Have an awesome night now.